pathways. <laughs> Since uh, we've been doing this, really, this is the highest number of people that I've seen attend. And it's such a great crowd, and people have so much energy around this issue. It's an important issue for us here at the hospital. It's an important issue for me. I've spent my career as an OBGYN dedicated to helping improve the health and welfare for women in our communities. And personally, this is a very important thing for me. At the hospital over the past few years, what we've really been doing is increasing the number of physician services that we have that address women's health. I think it's personally important for people to be able to get that care here in Howard County. And we have Hopkins level care that is here, which is amazing. So let's hear it for all the great. <laughs> And to that end, the breast center that we have is relatively new. It was a hallway before, and now it is an entire <laughs> practice. So we're very happy with being able to accomplish that. And over time, we've added many more GYN subspecialists to also address the needs of women in this community. So very important for us to be able to increase that. And the vision really is to address the needs and be able to take care of all those things. So over time, we are continuing to grow and we will continue on that pathway. So uh, this morning, we're going to have a great panel with some wonderful experts here that Dr. Jeanette Mazarian will be moderating, and she's our chief medical officer. But one of the things that we think is very important for you to hear is this can be nebulous if you don't know what the experience is of having cancer. And it may be something that, you know, happens to other people, but doesn't necessarily happen to you. So I'm really happy to say this morning, we actually have a patient voice to be able to talk about the experience and relate to it. Because sometimes as we're talking about all the structures and the medical things that we're doing for it, it really is about a patient experience and how we're managing that holistically. So I want to introduce Barbara to come to you. Um, I want to say thank you to Dr. Ahmed and the entire panel, oh, uh, especially Dr. Sukumro for including me on this because um, um, I just thank all of you for your time because it's the most uh, valuable thing that we all have and it's finite and I was made aware of that. Um, my story, I think it's a success story in the sense that this is not a club that I want anybody to belong to. <laughs> but once you belong to it, it's for life and you have a sisterhood that supports you and also men, but you know, because it also happens to men, let's be, let's be clear. But the, the thing that I would like to uh, say is that uh, it's important to educate ourselves that knowledge is power and that we have options because one out of eight women in the United States will have breast cancer, will get diagnosed. The earliest, the better. Um, mine was an early diagnosis, early enough, so it was stage uh, two, uh, triple positive, which is not a good thing, but it was good enough that it was caught on time. Um, I decided to come to Howard County because I know the services were fantastic and I have Johns Hopkins, so hey. Um, I had a different doctor and he was in uh, Baltimore, so I had a wonderful new doctor and she's my angel, my guardian angel. Um, the process is, at first when you don't know, it's very cumbersome and it becomes like, oh my God, oh my God, but you know, once that and everybody processes differently, but once you come to terms and you um, see other people that have done it and you inform, and when I say you inform yourself, you have the professionals and you go and look at uh, things that are uh, the scientific method. You don't go, I mean, exoteric, I'm not saying mm -hmm. that, but, and they give you a plan and they give you options. Um, then you are in charge. I mean, you. You take that leap of faith, and that I think that's very important. And you've seen other people that have gone through this before. Uh, my sister is there, <laughs> and she's a breast cancer survivor. I'm sorry, I didn't wasn't expecting her. So, um, so the most important thing is to inform yourself, trust the process, and then you have a support network. And don't be afraid of asking questions. And some of the questions can be random, but you know, you take care of yourself, go with the process. And one of the things that, I don't know if Carla is here, one of my nurses, but she said, 
you don't have to do 100% of what we ask you. If you do 70%, so my options were a, I could have a lumpectomy or a double mastectomy. And I said, I'm doing this once. <laughs> and uh, I'm not doing more. <laughs> and doctors are like, well, you have options. We can decide, like, no, I'm done. I, I mean, once I'm done. So I did that. And then um, my options, I had to do uh, chemo first. And then I did the surgery and my chemo went fairly well with the extension the first time because I'm a little gung ho and everybody knows that when I do things, I just <laughs> jump in there. <laughs> so uh, the nutrition, the this, I say, okay, first chemo. So let's see, um, I'm gonna have walnuts. So I had a bowl of walnuts and that didn't go well. After <laughs> that, oh yeah, I thought I was gonna die. My husband thought, oh my God, because I got really, but after that, and you know, the things you don't know and the little tricks and you listen to, you have the the uh, Mayor Broccolini Center. And the thing is that people are so willing to give mm -hmm. and provide that support that mm -hmm. it's doable. I done it. I mean, I had a 3D mammogram because, you know, and it, there's no question that is a stupid question. There's no question you should be afraid. I haven't lost my dignity. I love my inhibitions and I have enjoyed so I have enjoyed that in the process because you know you go, well, I mean everybody has seen me at that point. So you know my my go to my weapons of choice are humor and sass and everybody. So um I was fortunate enough that in my misfortune, I have a million. So the doctors, the nurses, inter I had not had a single bad interaction in this center or any of my doctors. So Dr. Sagrano is, I have her for life. I mean, she, I'm her stalker now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Dr. Uh, Mundi and Dr. Sastri, oh, and the nurses. Um, but um, take charge of your care and by taking charge give yourself the time and everybody process it to feel sad but saying why me why these why that that's not gonna you just you know just embrace the suck if you you know be part of the process and I went to work because I was like what the heck am I gonna do at home mm -hmm. I mean honest uh nutrition is important so I went really um, you know, vegetables and this and that, but um, everything went according to plan. So I had my mastectomy, then I had my uh, D flat reconstruction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I had two revisions, then I was part of a panel at Hopkins. So I had my moments of looking at myself and going, what the heck happened? And he goes, uh, I lost my hair and I rock. Uh, my husband has no hair. Oh, I'm <laughs> not. <laughs> so the, um, the thing I want to know is that I'm here. Anybody has any questions, it might be. And I have one thing to say. There's no embarrassing questions because your skin is going to, everything is going to go haywire. Mm -hmm. And there's always going to be somebody that is like, there's no shame. I mean, we're going through the same thing, a different uh, thing. So please um, check your tatas <laughs> and uh, because early detection is key and be putting yourself and, and taking that leap of faith and putting your trust and your faith in, in a medical team that it's doable by all means. And that uh, shout out to my sister, Pam. Thank you. Thank you it's so been 16 years cancer free. 15. 15. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Nazarian. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here in Howard County. I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you, Barbara. Oh, thank it's you. Great. It's great to hear from you as a patient. Um, so we have a panel of experts here, Both we have a panel in front and a panel also in front facing the other way, who I'm going to introduce. On our panel today, and I'll start over next to Barbara, we have Dr. Nia Leek, who's an, uh, from Obstetrics and Gynecology and our chair of OBGYN here at Howard County Medical Center. Next to Dr. Leek, we have Dr. Stewart, who is a gynecologic oncologist and is part of our DOAN oncology team here. 
And then we, of course, have Dr. Oliteo Segunro, who's our breast surgeon for oncologist. And sitting in the front row on the other side, we have Dr. Susan Ball, who just joined us, who's part of our team now. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Dr. Daniel Patterson, do your gynecology. And our special guest star is Dr. Mara Watson, who's from our gynecology. <laughs> <laughs> and then Dr. Lisa Jacobs, who's another one of our breast surgical oncologists. So So our first question is for Dr. Leek. Uh, Dr. Leek, we hear so much about cervical cancer. We know that in the United States, we see over 11,500 new cases every year, and know that it is strongly associated with HPV infection, which is the human papillomavirus. As a gynecologist, can you tell us a bit more about what the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer are, what the treatment options are, if there's any way to prevent it? Well, thank you for that question. It's an important question. Um, but something that's a little bit unique about cervical cancer is that there are many steps leading up to cervical cancer that we can prevent the progression. And so for cervical cancer, it really begins in the pediatric office. So we have a vaccine that can immunize all persons, men and women, girls and boys, against the HPV virus, also known as the human papilloma virus. And it can start, um, vaccinations are started around the age of nine, and right now it's approved up to the age of 45. But the goal is to be vaccinated before exposure. And that's for young men, young women, both all persons. And with that vaccination in the last 12 years, we've noticed that 80% of our young women have been clear of infection. And we know that there is a direct causation between HPV and cervical cancer. And so that is just the first step to preventing cervical cancer. The second step is regular GYN visits with your primary gynecologist for your screening pap smears. Now, I know that over the years, there's been some confusion if you go up long enough that I have, the days when we used to start it super early every year. And so, you know, the data has changed and your doctor's like, we don't need to do it every year, depending on what your risk factors and what your history are. And that is because of that HPV virus, that we know about it and that we can prevent it. So on average, we do general screening pap smears about every three years, starting at the age of 21. But that will change based on your history and the risk factors that you have. So please make sure that you're still talking with your gynecologist on a yearly basis and that you are doing that screening test. And the good thing about that screening test, it can show cells as though kind of early in the progression, so we can see whether or not you may be at risk for developing cervical cancer. So we can, as we've already talked about, the significance of early intervention, making sure that we are preventing it by routine screening. And if during that course of your um, pap smears, we notice that there may be cells that are abnormal, then there are additional things that we can do to manage that, again, with the goal of preventing cancer. So there are certain interventions we can do. We can increase screening. There are minor procedures that we can do, um, looking, making sure we didn't miss anything on the pap smear, but also hopefully treating it. And then we can even go so far as, if necessary, to remove the cervix in order to prevent cervical cancer. But if we do get to the point of cervical cancer, then that's when we lean on our gynecology oncologists. That's when we lean on our team from the radiology department to look to make sure it's not anywhere else. That's when we have um, conversations with our world-renowned pathologists who specialize specifically 
and looking at the cells and um, predicting what the cervical cancer may do. And then we have state-of-the-art equipment and state-of-the-art surgeons who can then proceed to, if surgery is required, we have great relationships with our medical oncology team for chemotherapy. We have radiation therapists and specialists and we can do internal and external. And so the problem with cervical cancer is there's usually not signs of, um, or symptoms that you'll notice on a day-to-day -day basis. It does require interaction and screening with your physicians in order to detect it. And so um, our real goal is preventing cervical cancer. So then that way we don't have to treat it. Mm -hmm. Nope. Great question. We're going to do questions actually at the end, but that's okay. Hold your question. You get to be birds in line for questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our second question is for Dr. Stewart. Uh, the effect of cancer on reproductive health is so important. In 2024, the American Cancer Society est estimates that about 19,680 women will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer in the United States. Can you tell us more about ovarian cancer? What are the signs and symptoms? How do we screen for it? And how do we treat it? Yes, um, of course. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so ovarian cancer is a difficult cancer. Um, it is a relatively rare cancer, however. It affects approximately 1.7% of the population. One important thing just to sort of start out knowing one's ovarian cancer risk is knowing one's family history and also knowing an individual's mutation status. And if they happen to harbor a genetic mutation such as BRCA or some of the other um, mutations. And that really sets the stage for just understanding your baseline risk. Do you have a family history of it? Do you have a mutation? Are you at the baseline risk of 1.7%? Um, the um, issue with ovarian cancer is that there really is not a adequate screening test that has ever been approved. It has been researched for decades to try to come up with a screening test for a general asymptomatic population. So unlike cervical cancer that has a pap smear and breast cancer that has a mammogram, ovarian cancer does not have a screening test. So patients often get confused when they maybe get an ovarian cancer diagnosis just a month or two after they had a normal GYN exam. And you do see that happen because pap smears are not used for the detection of ovarian cancer. Um, and there are often not a lot of physical signs or symptoms that one might pick up on it on, until the disease is more advanced. So the typical signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer, they are nonspecific, but they are typically gastrointestinal types of symptoms. So patients might mistake them for lots of other things. You know, suddenly they're having difficulty eating, drinking. They can't hold, they eat one or two bites and they feel full. They've got a lot of heartburn. They have a lot of just maybe generalized abdominal or pelvic pain, sometimes pelvic pressure or, you know, recurrent UTIs or change in their bowel habits can also be a sign. Um, and the other big thing is abdominal bloating and abdominal distension. So we typically tell people that, you know, you should always be mindful of the symptoms that you're having. And often these types of symptoms get presented to either a general gynecologist or often a primary care doctor first. And I think we usually use the rule of saying, well, if something's really persistent for a couple of weeks, right? Not a day, but it's a couple of weeks and it's not getting better Then it warrants an evaluation. And so that really becomes like, how do we screen? Well, in a symptomatic patient who either maybe has a, a mass detected on a physical exam or seems to have these symptoms, a provider would start with typically an ultrasound and or a CT scan of the abdomen pelvis, depending on a patient's specific symptoms, right? Because most patients that present with bloating and, you know, all of these symptoms are not going to have ovarian cancer, right? Most of these patients are going to have other things that are not, not malignancies. So depending on the symptoms, we usually would start with a ultrasound and or a CT scan. And then sometimes we use a blood test called a CA-125 that you may have heard about. And that's a blood test. There's a tumor marker you can test in the blood to look for ovarian cancer, but it does not diagnose ovarian cancer. It's more useful in the setting of having an ovarian mass, giving us an idea of what to expect surgically, but it doesn't effectively rule out or rule in the diagnosis. So it in and of itself does not diagnose <laughs> cancer. Um, and the and then the other thing is because of this, you know, many times patients are de are are detected in the advanced stage three and stage four. Um, but in terms of treatment, 
the treatment options for ovarian cancer really have um, changed and improved over the past 10 years. So the mainstays of treatment are really a combination of surgery and chemotherapy. Um, and with that, about 80% of patients will actually have a complete response and we're able to get them to no evidence of disease and, and, and they do quite well. Um, and with some newer medications that have been approved, we have more maintenance therapies and targeted therapies. And so patients are living a lot longer with ovarian cancer than they were 10 and 15 years ago. Um, but the... Um, but the treatment really depends on the individual type of tumor and the individual stage, which can vary widely because ovarian cancer is not all created equally. So hopefully that cleared it up a little bit. <laughs> Great. We give a whole hour about that. We're going to have some time, which is good. Hey, Dr. Sidonio. Uh, breast cancer is the number one type of cancer in women in the United States, affecting a whopping one in eight women. Can you tell us some of the risk factors for breast cancer? Tell us how we can screen for breast cancer and what are the mainstays of treatment? Thank you so much. And again, thank you everyone for attending today. So breast cancer is a very um, hard disease to treat, but also a hard disease to be a family member of someone who has it. Um, I'm just gonna ask a show of hands. How many here in this room have ever been personally affected by breast cancer or had a family member or very close friend affected by breast cancer? Okay, so that's a lot, right? So just by being born a biological woman, okay, with two ovaries, sometimes even just one, but you know, we'll have two, right? um, you are going to have a 12.5% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer, okay? So that's the one in eight. We oftentimes round that number to 13. And so just not including family history, not including environmental factors and things like that, or genetic mutations, that risk is relatively high. So if you have a room of 100 women, right, that means about 13 of them are going to get breast cancer in their lifetime. So we need to say, what do we need to do about this disease? How can we A, diagnose it? So the biggest thing is early detection. So unfortunately, Breast cancer is going to affect a lot of people. We just did a show of hands and we saw that. So it's not a matter of necessarily curing it, which we want, right? We march and we do all those things and eventually want to cure, but it's a matter of treating it when it's in its early stages. So we want to make sure that we are getting our screening mammograms. So mammography is the screening technology for breast cancer. So a mammogram is something that we start at age 40, okay? And the average risk patients, we should start at age 40. When we do a mammogram, a mammogram has about a 90% sensitivity and specificity for developing or for detecting breast cancer, which means that about 90% of breast cancers are going to be found on a mammogram. And that's from even the early stages. So we're seeing calcifications, right? We can diagnose stage zero breast cancer, okay, with mammography. And it's important that we do our screening mammograms because if something is found on that, then we can move to additional technologies like diagnostic imaging, like diagnostic mammograms, ultrasound and the addition of MRI. So when we actually add MRI to screening mammography in patients that are high risk, we have a sensitivity and specificity close to 100%, okay? So that, that starts with making sure that you know your risk. So I wanted to make sure that everyone knows just by being born, that's your risk. Now let's add some other risk factors like family history, okay? Having a family history of breast cancer, particularly in first degree relatives, so a first degree relative is your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your son, or daughter. A second degree relative is like your aunt, you know, or your uncle. Um, and I include uncle and dad and brother in there because men do get breast cancer. Like Barbara explained, you know, women have about a 13% lifetime risk. Male breast cancer is less than 1%, but it's still there. Men do get breast cancer. So important, it's important to understand. Now, having a first degree relative with breast cancer increases your risk of breast cancer significantly. We talked about the lifetime risk for average people being 13%. Anyone who is calculated at a lifetime risk of greater than 20%, we consider them a high risk breast cancer patient. So if you know your family history, you're able to talk to your physician or your provider, right, to talk about your risk. And if you're, developed, if you're determined to be a high risk patient, you'll get into high risk breast cancer screening. So for the average patient, mammograms start at age 40 annually. But for someone who's high risk, your mammograms actually should start 10 years before the youngest age of the person who was diagnosed. So for example, if you have a mom, daughter, sister, aunt, first degree relative that was diagnosed at age 48 with breast cancer, you should start your screening mammography at age 38. 
Okay. But again, where does that start with knowing your family history? I bring this up particularly because um, knowing family history is so important to me. And I know that we're talking about breast cancer more and more and we're doing it, but it's a lot of families don't talk about what's going on with them, right? Does anyone come from those families? Like, you're like, grandpa had this, but we don't really know. And oh, the grandma had this, and we don't really know. And her toe was cut off, and we don't know why, right? Yeah, so it's important that we talk, right? Right. Like we all have heard those stories, right? So you have to know your family history because, and if you are someone affected, tell your family because it's not just about you, it's about their risk. So if you know your family history and you tell your family what you're going through, you're able to actually help them so they can get into high-risk screening programs. Here at John Hopkins Howard County Medical Center, we have a high-risk screening program with our breast center. So not only do we take care of breast cancer patients, we take care of those high-risk patients, right? We get you into your early screening um, and we get, or your high-risk screening, which could include, we have patients that were high-risk at age 25, right? So it's important to understand that, okay? So if your loved one has been diagnosed with breast cancer, make sure that they talk to their family members to know their risk. Greater than 20% lifetime risk is considered a high-risk breast cancer patient, and they should be enrolled in high-risk breast cancer screening. Um, in terms of some of the other risk factors, you know, we get a lot of research out there, and we're still working on it. You know, there aren't um, significant risk factors outside of family history, but a few that we have found to be strongly associated with uh, breast cancer is obesity, okay? So obesity is um, a risk factor for breast cancer because um, we have found that the increased exposure to estrogen in our lifetime, right, is uh, has been associated with breast cancer. So we've talked about hormone replacement and things like that have had some association. But our adipocytes, which are fat cells, they actually store excess estrogen so that's where the link between obesity and breast cancer risk has come. So definitely maintaining like a healthy lifestyle and, you know, healthy, normal um, weight, normal for you, everyone's different to normal for you, um, and what come within the confines of general healthy BMI is important to decrease your breast cancer risk. Um, in addition, um, we have found that patients who, um, a lot of studies have found that patients who consume high soy diets um, tend to have higher um, amounts of phytoestrogen, so plant-based estrogens, um, tend to be high in like strictly soy diets. Doesn't mean you need to go out here and get rid of all the soy in your fridge, okay? I'm talking about people who would eat significant amounts of soy. So a moderate amount of soy in your diet is fine, but diets that are heavy and rich in soy have been associated with increased risk of phyto plant-based estrogens. So that's also been identified as a risk factors in the majority of the studies that have looked at it. Um, and in terms of, um, so we talked about the screening, in terms of the main stage of treatment, so it's very important to understand that breast cancer is not just treated really by one person or one group of people. Um, breast cancer is treated by a team, a multidisciplinary team. We have surgical oncologists, that's who I am. Dr. Ball is a surgical oncologist. Dr. Lisa Jacobs is a um, surgical oncologist. We have medical oncologists. So as a surgical oncologist, I'm going to be offering you the treatment for breast cancer, which includes lumpectomy or mastectomy, and oftentimes no surgery um, if, if we're in a um, particular stage. But also we have medical oncologists. Medical oncologists are integral. They Every breast cancer patient needs a medical oncologist. Why? Because breast cancer is also treated with uh, medical therapy included, including chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, immunotherapy. I see Dr. Nimagata back there, Dr. Sassery's back there. If you guys want to wave, there are some of our medical <laughs> oncologists here. Um, and we also have radiation oncologists. So lumpectomy for breast cancer is just removing the small portion where the actual tumor is. It's not removing the whole breast. Lumpectomy is offered as a treatment option for breast cancer because when you pair lumpectomy plus radiation, we call it breast conservation therapy. So lumpectomy plus radiation, AKA breast conservation therapy, has the same outcomes in terms of overall survival and recurrence rates to mastectomy in the correct patient. So radiation oncologists are integral into that treatment. And I saw Dr. Cheston back there. So she's a radiation <laughs> oncologist in our um, community here as well. And they're integral to the team as well. In addition, we also have our breast radiologists, right? Don't we need to do a mammogram and find the cancer? So breast radiologists are very integral to the team and they're very helpful with us, for example, determining the extent of the disease, right? Because you may have one area in your breast that we see, but maybe you have something in the other breast or there might be different foci, different areas in the breast that have it that contribute to the surgical decision-making. So we have a whole team of experts that are involved in your breast cancer care and we talk every week. Um, and it's really important to know that we have 
all those specialists right here in Howard County sitting actually right here today as well, right? Um, so I think that it's so important for us to keep talking about breast cancer, but really talk to each other and talk to our families about it to understand our risk. And that's where the biggest um, benefit that we can get for reduction of the mortality of breast cancer. We have found over the last 50 years, we've been able to decrease the mortality, that's the death rate from breast cancer because of screening, because of early detection. So have we found a cure? No, but are we finding it earlier and we can actually treat it successfully? Yes, and that's the goal that we need to um, kind of make sure that we let everyone know that we have here available in Howard County. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to leave it. it. The good news is we are a little bit ahead, so we have more time for questions. So I'm going to start with our awesome. first question. Um, okay, so talking about HPV and cervical cancer. Now, if you have had HPV and your body has cleared itself, are you still at higher risk? Yes, possibly, only because with HPV, there are so many different strains and so there's no way to say which strain that you may have been exposed to previously versus not. And so without that vaccine covering the nine different types of strains, that just natural exposure does not protect you from the other strains if you are exposed to them. Okay, other questions? Go ahead. Um, for the um, cervical oncologist, um, uh, you mentioned that a sister, a direct relative, is at higher risk. What about nieces uh, or nephews? Do, should I be talking to and ensure that they are getting? Correct. So the highest risk is associated with first degree relatives, but there is a risk associated with second and third degree relatives as well, particularly if you have multiple second and third degrees. So the highest risk is if you have one first degree, so your mom, your sister, your dad, your brother, very high risk. But if you have three aunts or four aunts, right, those risks kind of add together to almost be a similar risk to having the one first degree relative. So multiple second or third degree relatives also confers a higher risk. And then I'm going to add another uh, layer to this. What about cancers that are uh, linked to maybe ovarian cancer, breast cancer, such as um, melanoma, bladder cancer, prostate cancer? What kind of risk? Beautiful question. Have? Thank you for asking. And so I just wanted to limit my talk because I could talk about breast cancer all day. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, child, I like, I didn't see the time. I was like, you know. So, and I have Dr. Ball here and Dr. Jacob Soups that can jump in as well. So in addition to family um, history, we have germline mutations that we can be born with. So basically mutations that we can be, bo be born with that increase our risk of developing breast cancer in our lifetime. So I talked about your lifetime risk being 13%. Well, if you were born with one of those germline mutations, some of the ones that you've probably all heard are BRCA1, BRCA2. Well, we have way more than that. I always say BRCA1 and 2 are like the 90s. We've known that for like forever. Like there's so many more now. We have things like PALB2, CHECK2, so many other mutations that we have found that with a BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation, your lifetime risk is actually not 13%. It increases close to 80% in your lifetime of developing breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And so we have found, particularly with BRCA1 and BRCA2, that those are linked to other types of cancers. So a BRCA1 and BRCA2 mm -hmm. mutation have a high risk associated with ovarian cancer. They also have a risk associated with prostate cancer, and they also have a risk associated with pancreatic cancer and with melanoma. So it's not just important to know your family history for breast cancer, but for all the cancers. So I would say to patients, don't don't decipher what information I need to know. Give it all to me and let me decipher it. Because patients might be like, well, I didn't care that you needed to know that my uncle had prostate cancer. But then they tell me like, oh, I had five uncles with prostate cancer. I need to know that because you need genetic testing, right? So it's important to know that. So there are actually several other cancers that are associated with it. So did you want to add anything, Dr. Ball? Yeah, can I? Thank Please. you so much. Um, I love this conversation because I can't stress enough oh. talking to your families, like everyone mm -hmm. has said. And it may seem intuitive, but yes, your father's side of the family counts. I once had a patient that said, well, all the breast cancer is um, on my dad's side of the family, and that doesn't count, right? Yes, it does. <laughs> so yes, yes, both sides of the family, all of your family, we just we need to know. Right. Sorry, this is an answer. Yes. Dr. Stewart, can you address 
a topic near and dear to us, and that's lowering your risk of ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. Yes, lowering your risk of ovarian cancer. So, you know, interestingly, I would say ovarian cancer is, is a rare diagnosis, and like we talked about genetics. So actually, one of the biggest factors about knowing your mutation status mm -hmm. and knowing your family history with all of your family, just like we just discussed, is that if you have a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, your risk of ovarian cancer suddenly goes to 20%, 40%, which is a very high lifetime risk for, an, for a cancer that has no screening test. There is no special radiology study to guarantee you don't have ovarian cancer. So in those patients, we actually talk to them about risk-reducing surgery. And often these patients are being seen by a breast oncologist and similar to a G1 oncologist because they often they find out sometimes in the setting of a breast cancer diagnosis, but sometimes in the setting of genetic mutation prior to having any cancer diagnosis. And obviously that's always the preferred way to find out. So then from, a, from an ovarian cancer standpoint, um, we do talk about offering risk-reducing surgery between the ages of mostly 35 to 45, depending on the exact mutation and the exact family history. Typically this includes removal of the ovaries and the tubes um, via a laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery. Um, now there is, we are looking at the use of what's called opportunistic salpingectomy or removing fallopian tubes earlier in patients who either this desire surgical sterilization, or maybe have a BRCA mutation, but they're not quite ready for ovarian removal. This is still under investigation and we have a lot of data about it, but it's not yet sort of prime time everywhere. But one thing that has changed over the past probably five to five to seven years is that when you have your tube, we used to say you get your tubes tied, right? You want your, you want, you don't want to have babies anymore. So now instead of actually doing that, we remove the entire fallopian tube. So even like at time of C-section, like they'll actually remove the entire tube. Or if you need want your tubes out, you'll remove the tube. That has actually been shown to decrease the risk of ovarian cancer. Now, the one thing you have to remember is in an average faith person, if the, if the risk is 1.7%, you know, it, it, it decreases a little bit more. But it really is important in those people who have the higher risk, um, the higher risk, um, either family history or mutation. But because there is no screening test, removing tubes is something that we are looking at starting to think about doing in patients who may be undergoing surgeries for other indications. So someone's going in for a routine appy, like an append removing their appendix, and they happen to be 45 and they definitely don't want more children, should we be just removing their tubes at the time of that surgery just to further decrease that risk? And that's really one of the things that um, my division is very active in um, some multi-center studies looking at that to try to decrease people's risk. Other questions? Go ahead. So where does uterine cancer fit into all of this? Yeah, I know. So actually, I realized when we went through those, like we didn't talk about endometrial cancer. <laughs> so let's give endometrial cancer. It's obviously it deserves, it's actually the most common gynecologic cancer in women. So it's more common than cervical cancer and more common than um, ovarian cancer. Um, so it is a it is a cancer that is, I guess we can I can give you kind of an overview like we did for ovarian cancer. So in terms of you know, what are the signs and symptoms of uterine cancer or endometrial cancer? Those are the same things. Mm -hmm. So the one good thing about endometrial cancer is that the people typically have symptoms. It's usually abnormal uterine bleeding or postmenopausal mm -hmm. bleeding. So most mm -hmm. uterine cancer is able to be detected early via symptoms. There is no routine screening test, but if you go to your gynecologist for your routine appointments every year, one of the things they always ask you is, are your periods normal? Are you postmenopausal? Are you spotting between periods? You know, are you postmenopausal and suddenly you're bleeding and you haven't been bleeding in five years? So knowing the bleeding pattern is very important. <clears throat> and I think the most important thing for people to know is that after menopause, no one should ever have any bleeding. Even if it's just one day of spotting, it, it or even a tiny bit of the same thing that looks pink tinged, that should be evaluated by a gynecologist. Mm -hmm. And usually a gynecologist will will order an ultrasound and, and do an endometrial biopsy and assess that uterine lining mm -hmm. and really to rule out a endometrial cancer. And then in terms of how we treat it, we typically treat it surgically um, and it is treated with a minimally invasive, usually hysterectomy, we remove the uterus, the cervix, the tubes, the ovaries, and we also sample the lymph nodes typically mm -hmm. in the pelvis. 
And the vast majority of endometrial cancers can actually be treated with surgery alone, but there are some that require additional treatment with chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or radiation therapy, depending on when, what stage we detect it and what exact endometrial cancer it is. Does it have a genetic component as well? It does. Um, so um, we often discuss what's called Lynch syndrome, mm -hmm. which is one of the, um, it's, it's a mismatch repair deficiency and there's a few genes. Mm -hmm. Similarly, patients with Lynch syndrome typically have a very high risk of colon cancer and endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so just like we talked about before, knowing one's history is very important. Mm -hmm. And in those patients, we also offer them risk reducing surgery. Um, Lynch syndrome does carry a small a risk of ovarian cancer. It's smaller than BRCA, mm -hmm. and it depends on which gene, but we also offer risk-reducing ovarian removal at the time of the removal of the uterus as well. Thank mm -hmm. you. Great. But what age group do you see the most diagnoses for breast cancer nowadays? Great question. And I'm going to put my partner, Dr. Lisa Jacobs, on the spot. <laughs> Only because we've had so many conversations about this and we have some, some thoughts. So I'm going to hand this over to her. Hi, thank you for asking this question. So actually, it, I, I believe the median age right now is about 65. So the median, median being the midpoint of when the breast cancer occurs. So if you take all the people, you know, when you take everybody the, in the middle point would be 65. Uh, the nice one good thing about breast cancer is as you, as you get older, it tends to be less aggressive. Mm -hmm. So women who get breast cancer in their 80s, about 80% mm -hmm. will have hormone receptor positive breast cancer, which is less aggressive. Women who are diagnosed in their 40s, it's only about 40% will be hormone receptor positive. So mm -hmm. as you age, it's usually better. Um, so they're less aggressive. This does allow us to be somewhat less aggressive in women who are over 70. We've had research in women over 70 that we have opportunities and it's the Choosing Wisely campaign, which is an, or a, it's an agreement where people have come up with guidelines on what to do in women over 70. And you can sometimes eliminate some things like not testing the lymph nodes in women over 70, also not testing, uh, not doing um, radiation therapy in some of those cases. So in those groups, there are opportunities that we can sometimes, if the tumors are less aggressive, then we can be less aggressive. Now, the tumors have to be those less aggressive ones. The other concern we've had that we've been doing some research on is we seem to have seen a large number of people who are in their 80s coming in with really aggressive tumors. We don't know why. We actually tried to figure that out from one of our large nat national databases, but unfortunately, uh, the, the data is still a couple of years behind, so we feel like our observations are maybe a little bit too soon. Um, we do feel like that those women even if they're over 70, they'd have to be treated aggressively, even if they're over 70. So we we have several women right now in their 80s that are on chemotherapy and things like that. But median age is about 65. And oh, as you age, the tumors tend to be less aggressive. And I will just add to that, that we are seeing certain subtypes of breast cancer in very young patients. So a subtype of breast cancer is called triple negative breast cancer or TNBC. And it's breast cancer that doesn't have estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, or a protein called HER2, new receptors. And that is the most aggressive form of breast cancer. And we are actually finding those mostly in young patients, except we, like we're talking, we actually have found in a few patients where we're like, this is crazy, why? But generally it tends to be in patients who are under age 40. So young patients, they tend to be in women of color um, and um, they tend to be in very aggressive. So most breast cancers are actually diagnosed very early because we have screening, right? So most breast cancers are diagnosed at a stage zero, one, and two. We have tied five total stages. We have stage zero, stage one, two, three, and four. Stage zero, one, and two are considered early stage breast cancer. And our numbers for overall survival, so if you're diagnosed with an early stage breast cancer, zero, one, or two, you have a 90% or greater chance of survival with the appropriate treatment. So it's very treatable. However, what we've been finding in those very aggressive forms, the triple negative forms, they tend to be diagnosed at higher stages. So we often, by that they're so aggressive that we get those at like towards the end of stage two when we come to stage three, and a lot of times stage four. So it's very aggressive, it's hard to treat, and we tend to find them in younger patients. So even though the average age is older, there are some subtypes that are extremely aggressive in younger patients, unfortunately. Did you have a question? 
So um, I've been told that I have a dance tissue. Every time I go for my mammogram, they're like, well, no, we want to send you to a biopsy. We want you to come back every six months. And as you were talking about this triple negative breast cancer, I'm like, how do you detect that? Because I am, you know, I'm in that category because it's like, you come back every six months because we can't tell. And they sent me for um, sonogram at, at some point. And like, we, we may send you for MRI, but we want you to come every six months. So I'm like, I don't know. And I'm always worried every time I have to go there. So how, what, what can I do? That's a great question. And feel free if anyone wants to jump in too. So um, I know this is a question that Dr. Watson and I have discussed too. So um, dense breasts, is really more of a physiological characteristic. So I just want to take a step back because I know it was a Katie Keurig that got mm -hmm. um, breast cancer a few a couple of years ago and then was talking about dense breasts and then everyone called our office and all our voicemails entirely full because mm -hmm. everyone needed to know about dense breasts. So I'm going to take a step back. So when we talk about breast density, our breasts are made up in terms of the anatomical structure are made up of lobules and ducts. Okay, those are kind of the main structures that make up our breast. Mm -hmm. Then the rest of our breast is made up of kind of fatty tissue, stroma tissue. When we're younger, our breasts tend to be more dense because they have more lobules and ducts. Lobules and ducts are the cells that make the milk and the milk comes out of the duct, goes out of the nipple. So they're the active part of our breast tissue. When you have a higher component of fat, that makes your breast more dense. And it's harder for imaging modalities to see through that. So a mammogram is actually an x-ray. Mammogram uses x-ray technology. So it's hard for it to see through tissue that's dense, that's very, that's more active. So that's why, for example, we don't, if a young woman came in and had a mass in her breast, we, mammogram is not the first thing because it's not going to see anything because their tissue is so dense. As we get older, okay, our breasts become less dense because we have less of a need for the capacity as mammals to produce milk, and it gets more replaced with the fatty stromal tissue. And I hate to say it, and I hate to use that word, ladies, but that's why as we get older, breasts sag, right? Because they lose that dense structure, right? It's, it's a fact of life, okay? So basically, when your breasts are more dense, so you can have patients who are older that just have more dense than other people, more dense breasts than others, because that's just their anatomical structure. So we actually categorize density into kind of four different areas, depending on which system you use. But we have dense that are, breasts that are extremely dense. We have dense breasts that are kind of in the middle. And then we have breasts that are mostly fat. Okay. So if you're in a density that you're kind of in that extremely dense um, category, we kind of say it's not necessarily just because you're dense or more, your breasts are more dense and makes you at higher risk. It's that our imaging modalities don't have the capability of seeing through that tissue. So they may not be as sensitive and specific. So I told you that number from mammogram being 90% is going to catch 90%. That's in the average um, risk and in the average breast type, right? That's in that middle 80%. It doesn't necessarily mean it's in the extremely dense group. So in those extremely dense groups, we need to add additional modalities to them like ultrasound and MRI. So actually a lot of times if a patient has extremely dense breasts um, and on top of it, they have a family history, but even just your breast density, that'll warrant additional investigation with oftentimes an MRI. I do say, talk to your physician about this. I'm not saying everyone jump out here and go get an MRI, okay? <laughs> what I'm saying is that I just want people to understand that when we talk about the term density, Every woman has some level of density to their breast. So I just don't want, you know, everyone to be alarmed. So it's up to your physician and your breast surgical team to kind of look at the level of density you have and um, look at that with your risk and kind of mitigate those with your family history. But having dense breasts does increase your risk because of the fact that our standard imaging modalities may miss something because of the density. Hope that helps. It does. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, I just want to add the importance of self-breast exam because I all, we've, I've seen patients, and everyone can probably reiterate this, that, oh, I just had a normal mammogram six months ago, right? So the importance of really knowing that mammogram number one is not 100%, and we may and will miss things on routine screening mammogram. And a lot of it is not also because of breast density, but also where the abnormality could be. So areas that are not in the scope of a screening mammogram. It could be really in the middle mm -hmm. or in your armpit um, or way below. You can not see those on a routine screening mammogram because of where everything is. So mm -hmm. self breast exam, check yourself routinely um, because you can catch something that the mammal can't. Mm -hmm. yeah. Including skin lesions. So that's what I was gonna tell her. So 
when you, if you lift your breasts up, so, you know, women who have larger breasts and to have, um, you know, sometimes you may not be doing exams in that skin fold. We call that area kind of the inframammary fold. So also check that area. I have diagnosed cancers that look, they're like, well, I just thought it was a pimple, right? So basically it's not just necessarily breast masses, it's skin changes that may be associated with that area. I'm not saying a mole that you've had there since you were at 12 years old, okay? Like that, you know, it's probably not, but something that developed in you. So when you do those self-breast exams, people say all the time, well, I don't know what I'm feeling for, I'm not an expert. You're not, but you know when there's a change. Mm -hmm. And that's the key right. thing. Exactly. You're looking for the change, something that's different, okay? The other thing I tend to tell patients is when you're feeling masses, if you feel something somewhere else in the breast that feels the same, that's probably okay. And also the firmness of the thing that you're feeling really matters. So dense breast tissue feels like you're pushing on the end of your nose. Cancers feel like you're pushing on the bridge of your nose. They're much harder. So it's that, that firmness of that mass really matters. So one question I have that I was going to ask our panel of experts, because I will say I'm always confused by this. There's been a lot of conflicting information, I think, in the media, is if we're, how often do we get mammograms and how often do we get pap smears? Because I'll say, I think it's confusing even for people who should know. <laughs> <laughs> so great point. I'll take the mammogram part. So what's happened is that we have different bodies um, that kind of regulate um, or make recommendations for screening, right? We've had the USPTF, we have different people. So up until this year, so the reason for the confusion is the USPTF um, has been the last group to get on board of starting screening mammograms at age 40. So now there is no longer any questions and everyone has a consensus now that we start at age 40. There have been multiple different groups that make different recommendations, and a lot of those recommendations, so the USPTF obviously does the United States, but a lot of those other organizations like the World Health Organization, they're not just looking at the United States, they're looking at other countries. So it kind of varied because we're looking at international versus domestic. But now everyone is pretty much on the same page that screening mammogram should start at age 40 for the average risk patient. So that should hopefully answer that question. The USPTF and some other places will say biannual, but most recommendations um, and most of our um, breast organizations that we um, belong to and that we, the NCCN, a lot of our national guidelines say annual mammography starting at age 40. But there was a confusion about the age before. There was 40 versus 50. There is no longer a confusion. Everyone starts at age 40, okay? I have a question. Um, oh, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. Go ahead. You want to ask? Um, yeah. You're good? I think. No, we'll yeah. And then I'll have Dr. Watson answer for the um, okay. test. Okay. So I was wondering, what is the end age? Which will be <laughs> <super> <laughs> <hard>. <laughs> so, so this is what I'm going to do. That's a great question. Yeah. I'm going to let Dr. Watson answer the question just about the survey so that we, we have the starting ages and then we'll talk about the ending ages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, before about 15 years ago, we couldn't actually test people for HPV, the human papillomavirus. The pap smear was just a swab where the pathologist looked at it under the microscope and described what they saw. And so in those years, people got a pap smear yearly forever. Then we started to be able to test people for HPV in about 2006. So if you are over 30, 30 or over, and your pap smear is normal, and your test for HPV is negative, and you have a normal immune system, by that I mean you do not have HIV AIDS, you have not had an organ transplant, you're not on heavy duty immunosuppressants, and you, um, uh, you weren't DES exposed, and you still have a cervix, then you should have a pap smear with HPV testing every five years. You should still have an exam once a year, but you don't need a pap smear very often. Um, under 30, we generally don't test people for HPV because 80 to 90% of sexually active adults who didn't get vaccinated are gonna have HPV. So it's just really ubiquitous. Um, so between 21 and 29, girls get pap smears every three years, as long as it's normal. Now, if you're DES exposed, if you're HIV positive, if you had an organ transplant, if you've had severe dysplasia, so severe precancerous cells, then you need pap smears more often, but you know that's a really very individual um, conversation with your gynecologist. And what about women on hormone therapy, on tamoxifen? 
that doesn't increase the risk of cervical cancer. I'm sorry. You, but do they need to get, do they not need to get examined, make sure they get examined yearly? Or what do you do? What are you your know, concerns about that? Well, so tamoxifen has a very small increased risk of uterine cancer. Um, and again, it, it tends to be, a, when it happens, it tends to be a very not aggressive form of cancer, right, Dr. Stewart? Um, and so it typically presents with postmenopausal bleeding. So the, the, the surveillance is no different for women on tamoxifen versus not on tamoxifen. Thank you so much. And, and just really quickly, just to, add, just to add to that, though, that there is the differentiation between a pap smear and a GYN, and people tend to equate them. And I want to disequate them in the worst way, if possible, and couple them is that you still should be seeing your GYN yearly. <laughs> we have so many other issues. We have so many other concerns. And normally we're getting into menopause and we're having all sorts of changes and things like that. And so that is also what our role is. And it's also to make sure that you're getting your mammograms and that you're getting your screening or if there has been a change in your family history. So if we're not seeing you for five years, then we're not up to date as to what's going on. So this recommendation is still to at minimum to try and see your um, GYN, your general gynecologist, once a year. That does not necessarily predicate when you need to get your pap smears done. And that way you can still maintain your general health. Okay, super quick, end stages. And, uh, sorry, and, and, uh, I and, say and the, the, yeah, so the other question was, okay, <laughs> when do we stop screening? Do you, do you, want, to, do you want to take that? <clears throat> okay. 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 And that's a great question because I very commonly discuss. So I will look to my partners, but I would say that there are no national guidelines to say when you stop mammograms. So what I tell patients, it's a discussion, right? It's a shared decision-making discussion. Um, I will never tell someone to stop screening, but it's a discussion with the patient, the provider, overall health. Um, but there is nothing that says, up oh, you're 75, stop mammograms. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. You have to pull in family history. You have to pull in patient preference. Um, like Dr. Jacobs, Dr. Segundra said, we are seeing patients in their 80s with really aggressive breast mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. So who are we to say, stop screening at a certain age? So it is mm -hmm. a uh, shared making discussion with the patient and the provider. The, the one guideline, the only thing that people say is that if you would not be eligible for treatment. Yeah. Now, keep yeah. in mind, so if somebody has metastatic cancer of another type to their brain, it doesn't do much good to get a mammogram because the mammogram is trying to do early detection. So if you would be eligible for treatment, people that have, you know, that, that for whatever reason, they're on hospice, you shouldn't go get a mammogram. Um, the, so... The challenge in breast is that treatment could be a pill, a hormone therapy pill. Treatment could be a lumpectomy, which is a very minor outpatient surgery. So you have to be pretty sick <laughs> to not be eligible for treatment for breast cancer, which is why there's no top limit. And you have to recognize that the incidence of breast cancer continues to increase until about the age of 80 before it starts to drop off. So you wouldn't say stop at 75 because that you're still having an increasing incidence. Yeah, so just, so you probably, they're there, and I've heard this from patients, they're like my, you know, so-and-so told me to stop at this age. Just so you know, there has been some antiquated data, right? At some point in the history, we were putting some stop dates on there. We've all, all our guidelines have gotten rid of those stop dates because we see cancer into older ages. And remember, the and like Dr. Jacobs was saying, Really, we say if their life expect if they continue to have a good life expectancy, then you continue screening. If their life expectancy is not long, then the screening is basically not helpful. Right. So just don't let anyone say to you, "You're 78. You don't need any more mammograms." If you're still out jogging, right, you're probably better off. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, did what we, about you? Yeah, you oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. 65 for the most part. And your immune system is normal. So if you're DES exposed, you continue them forever. Yeah. If you've had severe dysplasia every three years for a really long time, um, if you're HIV positive, 
if you're immunosuppressed. So it's a circumstance. But if you're 65 and you've never had an abnormal pap smear and you're not DES exposed and you don't have HIV and you don't have an <laughs> organ transplant and you're HPV negative, then your risk of developing cervical cancer, you know, in the next 30, last 30 years of your life is very small. What, what is the Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. So it was a hormone given to women um, 50, 50 years ago, supposedly to prevent miscarriages. If you were DES, if your mother took DES, you you would know that. Uh, yeah. so, so we're getting, were, were there any other burning questions? No, I haven't heard anyone talk about rice. Like, does your race um, make you a higher risk to these certain cancers? You know, like for women of color, um, I know for black women, like when it comes to heart disease, diabetes, you know, we're always told that we have a greater risk of, of getting those things. So when it comes to cancers, how, how does brain play into that? So as I had mentioned before with triple negative breast cancer, we find that triple negative breast cancer has a higher risk in women of color, particularly first African-American women, mm -hmm. secondly, then Hispanic women. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, breast cancer, um, we have found that there have been some genetic differences in different races. And we're still, we don't, we can't, we're working on getting more data to be able to kind of pinpoint what some of these specific genetic um, differences are. But we've had some researchers like Dr. Lisa Newman um, in New York, for example, has done some large studies looking at Af um, women in sub-Saharan Africa. And we've actually identified some genes actually that confer them for a higher risk of triple negative breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Now we need to do larger studies and things like this to really be able to make this more um, population-based data. But we have definitely found some racial um, genetic differences that have conferred higher risk of particular subsets of breast cancer. And in African-American women, it's triple negative breast cancer. So young African-American women have a higher risk of triple negative breast cancer. And then in that triple negative breast cancer, we find that if we have those young patients with triple negative breast cancer, we do genetic testing with them because we find that they actually have a higher incidence of having an underlying genetic mutation, um, a germline mutation with that. So again, family history. So that way, if you know if you're that high risk, right, and you get into that early detection screen. Yeah. And there's also, we work with a group in Saudi Arabia that, uh, that's a Hopkins agreement. Dr. Sagunro goes over and does surgery. We, we have an agreement with them. And that popular, the Middle Eastern population also has a much lower age of diagnosis. And in fact, their country is right now looking at what their screening guidelines would be to decide, do they need to start at 40 or do they need to start sooner? And, and what do you start with? Because again, mammography doesn't work that well in women under 40. So basically, yes, breast density. yes, and we're working on it to get better guidelines to be able to address those racial disparities. Okay, and what about for the other two? Yeah, right. So from a gynecologic standpoint, it is most, um, you know, ovarian cancer and cervical cancer. We don't necessarily see a big difference in the incidence, but for uterine cancer, similar to breast cancer, African-American women are at a higher risk of some of the higher grade, more aggressive subtypes of endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. And we actually have been, there's a lot of data looking at this. And even in patients who, when you take sort of all endometrial cancer patients, those who are requiring additional treatment beyond just say surgery alone, women of color do have an increased risk of death from disease, even in the setting of what seems to be the correct standard of care treatments. So there's a lot of push in our field to try to understand what is it that is causing that increase in death in those women, even when we're giving them the best care that we know, right? Um, and then of course, like any cancer, there are a lot of reasons that people can have um, what looks on the surface like a risk, but then it actually boils down to being something else, right? So for cervix, we've discovered that, of course, exposure to HPV is really the driving force. Now, you do see differences in incidences, but that's more based on their exposure to HPV, not based on their race alone. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, we're running over a little bit. So I'm going to stop, just ask, ask Dr. Ahmed to give a couple remarks, and then I hope our panel will stay around for a few minutes. So, yeah. Let's hear for our panel. <laughs>
It's going to be wonderful to check in. It's really uh, going to be great pride as president of the hospital to see that we have such great specialists here. We have such great teams behind these specialists that are all working very hard to take care of the community. And it's just such an important topic. So I continually ask for support as we are looking at these different programs. We are very interested in the community supporting this so we can continue to do great things like this. But thank you again, everyone, for coming today. I appreciate it. I just wanted to add before we go, I would be remiss. Pink Pathways, um, this is the second year that we're doing this, and I just thank everyone for coming today. But this event could not have come together without the people who have really helped support um, me and the team in doing this. So I wanted to list them. Some of them are here. Chris Miller, she's the director of the Tina, um, Claudia Baker, Tina Brock, and Bruno Camp. He's not here because he's probably holding down the board in the breast center for me right now. Um, Carrie Singley, she's with Population Health. And Carrie, um, and you'll see them in their pink shirts, and they have, Carrie and Chris have these little um, little things with them, or little stud things. Um, and they have been absolutely phenomenal. We have a whole team that we've been meeting, recently we've been meeting every week, um, but we've been planning this for the last um, few months. We have Rachel Ricketts, who's part Part of the foundation. She was here earlier, but she's actually running another event at the same time, um, and so she's not physically here. We have Kristen Meyer, who's in the back from the, um, Kirsten Meyer, who's with the foundation, has been so integral in supporting and helping us get a team together. We have Kyrie Jacobs. She's one of our um, marketing um, um, extraordinaire. She's not physically here today, um, but she has all the signage and things like that. You can see the themes, the flyers, and all those. That's Kyrie. Um, we have um, David McPayton, who might be behind this thing right here, but he's running around and he was, he actually helped uh, me design the passports that you guys are all using. So these passports right here, in addition to um, our little meet the docs and a lot, there's David right there. He's one of our interns. Um, and then we have Safa is not able to make it today, but Safa is one of the interns in the, um, in the executive um, leadership program who helped us make sure that we get food ordered. So you guys are gonna be fed because Safa did all that. Um, we have Crystal Pope, who is in the other building right now, but helping with the population health. We have yeah, um, Orton, who's in the back there. Um, we have um, Larry Raymond, who's not here today. He's the, um, one of the administrators of the Breast Center, who's been so supportive in this. Um, and June Reynolds, who is one of our mammographers, um, of mammography techs, and she's not able to be with us today, too. But this group of people, there's been more people than that, but this group of 10, 11 people have been in it, meeting with me um, every week, month. Um, and I just want to say thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. So we're all going to head back towards the breast center. We've got food for you there, and then we've got raffles. So now it's time for food and fun. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>